Welcome back to the Joseph Carlson Show. On today's episode, we're gonna be reviewing three deep value companies. The way that I would define deep value is basically every metric on the table. Every one of them from the PE ratio, the price to books, the price to sales, the dividend yield, the historical valuation, all of them show that these companies are very deep value. Ally Financial is one of them. This company trades at a 4.5 PE ratio and it pays a 3.6% dividend yield. Paramount Global is another one. This company trades at a 9.3 PE ratio and has a dividend yield of 3.7%. And then Intel's the third one. This company's at a 10 PE ratio and a 3.9% forward dividend yield. So we'll be looking in depth on all three of these companies and I'll share my opinion on whether or not I plan on buying them. Now we also have a lot of news to go over in this episode as well. Howard Marks says now is the time to buy. Ed Petoniak, the CEO of Vici, went on to Mad Money with Jim Cramer to explain new potential categories that Vici may grow into. Tim Cook basically admitted that Apple's working on an AR VR headset and he even gave kind of a hint of when it would be released. And Apple reportedly is going to have a flood of new devices coming this fall. We'll be looking at this news and the rumored devices and what it could mean for Apple stock. So we have a lot to jump into. Let's go ahead and get started. First of all, looking at the last week, if I filter by the past five days, we're up 6.89%. That's $21,178. So this was actually a decent week. Stock prices moved up. We earned $1,000 in dividends in one week, $20,000 in capital gains, and that's nice to have but I really don't pay attention to this too much. It's interesting to look at, but these stock prices trade around week by week like crazy, and timing these moves is very difficult. A week ago, there was many people, many content creators, many YouTubers, many TikTokers, many financial Twitter accounts saying to not buy the dip, to stay away from it. And here we are up 7% in the past five days. This is the risk of trying to time the market that I've repeatedly warned people against. It is incredibly difficult to do and most people don't come out successful. I'm not doing that. I'm staying invested in these companies and I'm continually compounding my passive income. I record this level of passive income on a website that I use called Qualtrum Insights. This is available to all Patreon members. You can see the growth of it month over month throughout time. And I'll be adding in June's dividend income at the end of the month. So next week we'll see how much I earned in June. But I'll give you a little bit of a preview. So far in June, we've had a total of three dividend payments. We've had one on June 9th from Microsoft for $95 one from Target for $10, and then one from Texas Roadhouse for $140. So only three dividend payments so far this month. And based off just these three payments, it looks like it'll be a, a pretty low dividend amount this month. That's what it looks like because we're only gonna get, what, $200 in dividends, 250 bucks? That's not a lot, but we can get some more information on this. If I go back to Qualtrum, I can see my upcoming dividends. This is my dividend pipeline. These are ones that are not projected, they're not hypothetical. These are officially declared dividends that I am 100% going to get paid based on my current holdings. And I will get paid $552 from SCHD tomorrow. That'll hit my cash balance tomorrow. So this one dividend payment will raise my entire dividend income for the month to around $700, $800. This one dividend payment's gonna bail me out. Then on the 29th, we also have $26 from T. Rowe Price. And then July 7th, I have that $445 dividend from Vici. So all in all, this is adding up to what could be a pretty close to record month. It certainly will be a high one. So I'm excited to see the dividend income growing. So I'll have some cash to spend. I'll have a little bit to put in this portfolio and hopefully buy the most attractive companies I can. Now, before we get into companies I'm looking at and doing analysis on, I wanna just go through some input that Howard Marks has. In my humble opinion, I think that Howard Marks is one of the most remarkable, introspective investors of at least the past five years. When I look at different advice and, and different actions that investors took, I think that his overall was, was very good. Over the past three years, he behaved and acted and his input I think was far more valuable than most other investors input. So I pay attention to what he says. And to my delight, I was surprised to see and happy to see an article where Howard Marks was not cautious. He wasn't being defensive. For the past couple of years, he's been defensive and cautious. But right now he has turned aggressive. And in the article, he goes on about why he's being more aggressive. He says, quote, today I'm starting to behave more aggressively. 
Everything we deal in is significantly cheaper than it was six or 12 months ago. That is the key line there. Howard Marks does look at relative valuation. If prices go up rapidly, he's less eager to continue buying because he knows that those tend to revert back to the mean. When prices go down rapidly, that catches Howard Marks' attention and he's more eager to start buying. And it is true that basically everything in the equity markets right now is significantly cheaper than it was 12 months ago. Now what he deals with is high yield bonds, leverage loans, mortgage backed securities, and collateralized loan obligations. He's in a different category of investment, but the point still remains, and I think his advice here is completely applicable to what we're buying, which is typically stocks. And even though Howard Marks will posture himself to become a little bit more aggressive in his buying and a little bit more conservative, he also thinks that timing the market is a terrible idea. He says, quote, I think the idea of waiting for a bottom is a terrible idea. Assets could get cheaper than current valuations, in which case we'll buy more. Now, this statement can be confusing. If he is 100% invested right now, he has all of his money invested, he's not waiting for a bottom, and prices move down, what is he gonna use to buy more? In his case, he could raise money through different means. He could raise cash maybe from investors, and then he could do something else that we could do. He could look at investments that did not move much during those downward movements, because not every investment's gonna fall in price. So if the market moved down more, he could sell some investments, that have held up relatively well and move that money into the ones that have come down in price significantly. So even though you're 100% invested, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't buy more in the future. Most of us are gonna continue working, we'll have incomes that we can use to fund future investments, and we can sell conservative investments to make room for more aggressive ones. For example, if the stock market goes down another 20%, odds are Pepsi will go down like 5%. If that's the case, I could sell my Pepsi holding to buy more aggressive holdings in something like tech companies. So there are ways to stay 100% invested and continue to buy as the market moves down. And Howard Marks goes on of why he's being more aggressive right now than other points in the market. He says, quote, we're more aggressive if we think bargains are rife. So Howard Marks thinks right now bargains are rife. He says, and we are more defensive if we think the market is elevated and investor behavior is imprudent. And this is something that he's repeated over and over again. With the less prudence that other investors conduct themselves, the more prudence you need to have. And the more prudent other investors become, the less imprudent you should conduct yourself. So when other investors become less greedy, they start giving up on the stock market, they become fearful, they start selling out of good companies, that's when it's time to become really aggressive and buy deep value companies. Right now, if I look at my portfolio on the Dip Finder, which is a tool I developed as part of the Patreon membership, this tracks the movement of every single company against their 200 day moving average. That is a technical analysis term of tracking the momentum of a stock. If these companies have momentum downwards and momentum upwards, right now, every company in my portfolio has momentum downwards, except for Pepsi and Vici. VG is the only one that has positive momentum. So I completely agree with Howard Mark's sentiment here. So having said that, let's go ahead and look for deep value dividend paying companies. I have three of them currently that I wanna review. The first one that we're gonna look at is Ally Financial and the website we're using here is Qualtrum Insight. It's something we've developed as part of the Patreon membership. You can join the Patreon with a free trial with the link in the description or the pinned comment below. Now Ally Financial is a bank, so it's, it's an online bank. It's kind of a newer version of a bank where they don't have physical branches. And that's been a big cost advantage for Ally Financial. Because if you compare Ally Financial to something like Bank of America, right? You compare it to these two different companies, Bank of America or Wells Fargo or JP Morgan or Citigroup, all of them have thousands of different physical branches all across the United States. All of those branches have employees in them. They have rent, they have leases that they have to pay. And that adds to the cost of running a Bank of America. Well, Ally Financial came up with a different business model of having their bank have no physical branches, 100% online. And being 100% online improves their cost structure and allows them to do things that other banks simply don't do. For example, they have a 1% interest on their savings account. JB Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Typically, they don't do that. It's much lower. They have no overdraft fees. They were one of the first banks to get rid of the overdraft fees. And in terms of the concern of customer support, they have 24 seven customer support in both live chat and phone. So you can get a hold of them anytime 
even though they have no physical branch that you can walk into. Now this business model that Ally Financial has, having no physical branches, made it so that they could build up their business without taking on as much debt. That's one of the huge advantages that they have. For example, take a look at their funding composition. This is off of their most recent earnings report. They have deposits in purple, secured debt, which is the really bad debt in the gray there, and then they have other and unsecured debt. Over time, Ally Financial has gotten rid of more and more debt, and now they have almost no secured debt. So they've gotten rid of almost all of their bad debt, only 1% of their funding is from secured debt, and even unsecured debt only makes up 5%. That is a very small amount. And they do this because they can fund their entire business purely from deposits. That's the difference between them and other banks. They don't have as much overhead, so they don't need to take on as much debt. Now, in terms of valuation, it doesn't really get much cheaper for this high quality of a company. Ally Financial currently trades at a 4.5 PE ratio. That's a very low price to earnings, even if we are going into a recession. This is really low. In 2019, for example, this was a 9. So Ally Financial is trading at half the PE it was pre-COVID. And then the price to book is 0.8, which in absolute terms is also very inexpensive. So the basic metrics right now look like Ally's deep value. And if we bring up the price chart here, we can look at the past five years. This is how the company's traded. In 2017 to 2019, the company traded around $25 to $30. That's the price range. Then of course it sold off during COVID with everything else. And then it started its steady climb all the way back up to $55. Investors were excited during this time. All of financials, including JP Morgan and other big banks, traded up to record highs. And now the excitement has fizzled off and it's been replaced with fears. Many fears concerning their future. And right now the company trades at $35 per share, which you'll notice is right around where it was pre-COVID in 2019. But things have improved dramatically for Ally Financial since 2019. We've already seen that their balance sheet, their deposits, and their debt have all improved. They've had more deposits and less debt. That's a good thing. And it's actually improved significantly since 2019. But yet the stock trades at the same price. The liquidity composition of the company has also improved. They've added billions of highly liquid securities and cash equivalents. Their allowance for loan losses, which means how much wiggle room they have for loan losses has also over doubled. In 2019, it was 0.99%, so under 1%. And now it's 2.63%. So Ally Financial has a lot more margin of safety. They have a lot more wiggle room in case they take on loan losses. And this is important to keep in mind because the reason that Ally Financial is trading down so much right now is specifically for this concern. And that is because Ally Financial makes around 70% of their earnings from used auto loans. They are huge in the used auto loan market and investors have very big concerns about that. Here's a chart showing the average price of used cars over the past three years. In 2019, they're around 21,000. So if you wanted to buy an average used car, you're paying 21 grand. Then it went down a little bit to 20,000. Then in 2020, it started to climb, 22,000. Then in 2021, used car prices really exploded, going up to 27, 28, 29, $30,000, and they have not begun to come back down. Used car prices are now at $30,786. And this is the index price, meaning this is the average of all US car brands. This is a 44% increase in price over the past two years. And this increase in used car prices has certainly benefited Ally Financial. This is a big part of the reason their net income went from 380 million, 400 million, to 900 million in the course of one year. Loan volumes increased significantly because of used car prices going up 40%. And although that's been great for Ally Financial for 2021, the question is how long will those used car prices stay this high? Will they collapse? Will they go down 30, 40%? Or will they stay at a very high level for a long period of time? And this is where opinions differ greatly. Here's the CEO of Ally Financial and his opinion on the subject. But we think the normalization in used car pricing is going to be very, very gradual. In early signs uh, in 2020, 2022 is the market staying quite strong. What I will tell you within our financial projections that we provide to the street, we call for a 15% decline between uh, the start of 2022 and the end of 2023. I think the reality is going to likely pan out to be something different. We think used car prices are going to remain quite robust for the foreseeable future. He just said that he's calling for a 15% decline, 15% 
from 2022 to 2023. So they think used car prices will only decrease by 15% over the year. And he even says that those estimates are conservative and more than likely it'll go down less. Now Ally Financial's thoughts on the subject differ greatly from other YouTubers and people that work in the industry. Here's one example that recently got highlighted, the used car bubble. Lucky Lopez here goes to a repossession lot and says that repossessions are picking up because people are underwater in their used cars and they're gonna start ditching them, which would cause loan losses for investors in Ally Financial. He goes to parking lots where there's repossessed vehicles or unsold vehicles and he shows how many of them are coming in, that more and more repossessed or unsold vehicles are filling lots, and there's actually gonna be a car influx, not a desperate need for them like we have right now. There's also another piece of data I looked at from KPMG, which is a used car price market and whether or not it will crash. In it, they have a section called When the Music Stops, Nature Abhors Vacuums, and Market Support Imbalances. Demand and supply of new vehicles in the US will come back into equilibrium. How that happens will make an enormous difference to automakers, consumers, part suppliers, auto retailers, and perhaps the economy itself. Given the current trends of inflation, new car prices could continue to rise through 2022. However, as supply comes back, automakers are likely to reintroduce incentives and dealer margins will compress. As a result, we may see a reversal of some portion of the price increases. Whatever path the new car market takes to the new normal, used car prices will eventually return to the traditional relationship with new vehicle prices. In other words, a 20 to 30% plunge in used vehicle prices is in the cards. And then they show different charts illustrating likely outcomes based on inflation. But they admit this is not a perfect science and they really can't predict the outcome. What they can predict with a certain level of confidence is that used car prices won't trade in line with new cars for long. That is an imbalance in the market. And as we've seen over the past two years, imbalances eventually get worked out. So as of right now, I'm pretty torn on Ally Financial. I really am. The company's a fantastic company that saw a significant dip. It has growing revenues, EBITDA, cash flow. It has a better balance sheet. The dividend growth is superb. This company's grown its dividend like crazy over the past five years. It pays a very high 3.6% yield with a low payout ratio. So the dividend does have room to raise over time even more than what it's currently at, and the company's doing share buybacks. They raised their buyback program to two billion, and the shares have been going down steadily over the past five years. In terms of the metrics and the fundamentals of this company, it looks like it's incredibly well-priced, deep value, and it has very strong fundamentals. And maybe the market is overreacting and this is a great entry point. Now the next deep value dividend paying company we have is Paramount Global. This is the Paramount Plus company. This caught a lot of investors attention when Warren Buffett added it to his portfolio. This is actually a decent amount to their portfolio, a 0.72% weighting. Not insignificant when you're looking at $2.6 billion. So Berkshire thought Paramount was worth holding. The company also trades at a very low valuation, a 9.3 Ford PE rate. Ratio. That is well below the S&P 500 17. Over the past five years, this stock has continually been on a downward trend. It dipped heavily in 2020. Then it skyrocketed when Bill Huang used his $20 billion of leverage to bid it up to $94 a share. All that leverage quickly got unraveled back to where it was at $41 a share. And now the stock price is all the way down to $25 per share. Now over that steady decline in stock price, a lot has changed. Viacom and CBS merged together in 2019 to form Paramount Plus. That's why you see the rapid increase in their revenue going from $14.5 billion to 27.8 billion. This was because of a merger. This also caused their EBITDA to climb. You can see it go up in 2019. So even though the EBITDA is going up, like many content companies we've seen similar to Netflix, the free cash flow is going down because they have outflows of cash to pay for content that they will hopefully monetize by new subscriber gains. And this is where the difficulty of the story comes into play. The free cash flow is going down over time because the economics of cable companies is well proven to be very good economics, very profitable. The economics of streaming businesses is not yet proven to be very profitable. And you can see that through the free cash flow line. So as they make this transition from cable company to streaming company, it's very similar to what Disney's doing. And there's a lot of volatility and unknowns in the process, but they are driven to make this a successful and profitable change. Now the balance sheet shows that they have a lot of debt. In fact, if we filter by the amount of debt, you can see that in 2019 with that deal, their debt roughly doubled. 
and right now it's at 18.3 billion. But this debt has been moving in the right direction, down from 21 billion to 18.3 billion. So their debt's going down and their cash balance is increasing over time. Two things that I like to see, and as of right now, their debt really isn't considered a problem. They can cover it through their EBITDA. Now the shares outstanding for this stock jumped when they did the merger. So in 2019, the shares outstanding went up like crazy, but it's since basically leveled off. In the past four quarters, they haven't really issued any new shares, and they're not a company that I think wants to dilute the shareholder. So here's my thoughts on Paramount overall. The company fundamentally looks fine. The valuation of it's low, the dividend yield is high, the payout ratio is low. It looks like it's going in the right direction, but I'm very hesitant to jump in to another big entertainment company with a lot of debt transitioning from a legacy cable company to a new streaming company. The challenges these companies face in the process I think are immense. And we can see Disney going through these challenges right now. Disney is my biggest loser in my entire portfolio. The stock price went up like crazy and then it's gone back down since investors are starting to question the economics of streaming. So right now I'm already exposed to the streaming industry through Disney. I think eventually Disney and Netflix and other companies will prove that streaming has good economics. But as of right now, I don't wanna add any additional exposure to my portfolio. I already have Disney in it. I already have a thesis on this company. And I think Paramount Plus would be kind of more of the same. A big legacy company with a lot of debt moving from cable to streaming. So I know that Paramount Plus is not the same as Disney. I realize they're different companies, but they're in similar enough industries and situations that I don't wanna double my exposure. Now the next deep value dividend paying company I'm looking at is Intel. It trades at a 10 Ford PE ratio, an EV to EBITDA of 3.7. This is cheap. This is numerically cheap. The dividend yield is 3.95%. So you're getting almost a 4% starting yield on the company with a low payout ratio of 24. Moreover, if we look at the valuation, we can look at the free cash flow of this company. Generally speaking, it's been growing over time. In 2020, it was 20.9 billion. Last year, it was 9.6 billion. This is significant free cash flow. This means the company with its 157 billion market cap, is trading anywhere from a 10 price to free cash flow to a 20. That's a very cheap price to free cash flow ratio. And it's not like this company is trading at a price it normally trades at. It's currently down 21% below its 200 day moving average, which means the company is in a dip. In fact, if we bring up the price chart here, we zoom out 10 years, we can see that Intel right now is around 37 per share, and it's trading around the same price it was in 2017. And in between that time period, it's traded well above that up into $67 per share. So let's go ahead and look at the fundamentals of this company. First of all, we want revenue growth. This company is growing its revenue. Even though it's an old company that's getting beaten up by AMD and Nvidia, they're still growing revenue, which is something reassuring to investors. Another thing we wanna see is the EBITDA growing over time, and clearly the EBITDA is growing, especially over the past four years. The free cash flow, like we've seen, is generally speaking growing over time. This won't be perfectly consistent every single year, but you can see the trends. They are pumping out a lot of free cash flow every year. Their balance sheet actually looks really good. They currently have $38 billion in cash, $32 billion in debt. So this is actually a company that's cash rich. They have more cash than debt. And Intel also has been a very consistent dividend payer. They haven't grown it consecutively every single year. There's some years where they've taken a break in raising it, which I think is prudent from the, the management team to do when they need to. But you can see over the past 10 or so years, you've had pretty significant dividend growth with this company. Now, this is a company that historically has done a lot of share buybacks. So they've been paying a dividend and doing share buybacks, returning most of the capital immediately to shareholders. But you can see that over the past couple of quarters, they've taken a break from it. And I believe to do more CapEx spend, they're trying to reinvest back into the business to compete with AMD and Nvidia and other chip makers. Because we can see if we look at the CapEx spend, that it's gone up quite a bit over the past five years. And this can be viewed as a positive or a negative. For Intel investors, I view this as a positive. They have to spend heavily to continue making money and maintaining a competitive advantage. So I think this $20 billion in CapEx spend is probably well spent. So overall, Intel's another good dividend paying company that I think is in deep value territory. The big assessment here is whether or not you think this company 
can continue to compete with the likes of AMD. These companies have really raced ahead in their technology and Intel is kind of in catch up mode. You can see the revenue growth of a company like AMD. This is what they're competing with. Nvidia is another one. This company's raced ahead in technology, leaving Intel in the dust. So these are the issues that Intel's dealing with. And I don't think that it's it's a death sentence for Intel. I don't think it means the company's a bad investment. It's just a judgment from the investor. Do you think Intel will continue to grow and keep up with competition or will it get steamrolled by AMD? And my big reservation that I've always had with Intel is them keeping up with competition. In fact, out of these three companies, the one that I'm closest to buying, the one that I think has the best story, the best fundamentals, and the least amount of overall risk to its future is Ally Financial. This is one that I really could see myself buying in the near term future. I think that there's a decent chance that the concerns with Ally Financial are being overstated by the market. Ever since 2008, the market looks at any type of recession fare, any type of loan losses, and they think that banks are poison, that you have to avoid them. You have to get out of financials. And I think there's a very good chance that companies like Ally Financial will fare far better than expected, even in a recession. So those are three companies I'm looking at, but I haven't added any of them to the portfolio. And in the meantime, I will be using my cash balance to reinvest. So if I can't find any new company to buy currently, I'll deploy my cash into my current holdings. The way I do that is pretty simple. I just look at which company is selling off the most. I go in and add to the ones that I think have the best combination of their current future outlook and the lowest price. Now moving on, I wanna jump into some news here. One of my largest holdings, which is Vici Property, the CEO went on to Mad Money last week and he shared with Jim Cramer some, some different categories that Vici's looking into expanding into, different real estate that they're in talks of buying. And I wanna give my reaction to this. Now, before we jump into this clip, I have to mention today's sponsor. You probably know them, it's FTX US, which is one of the largest US regulated crypto exchanges. And this company has been on a sponsorship spree. You've seen their name all over the place from the Miami Heat Arena. They sponsored Steph Curry, Trevor Lawrence, Tom Brady, Kevin O'Leary, all these different big wigs because they wanna get their name out of their product and platform. Most people are familiar with FTX as a large cryptocurrency exchange. And it is true, if you're into cryptocurrency and you like trading this, you can go in and trade cryptocurrencies on FTX with with minimal fees. So their fees are far less than most of their competitors. They're also very well backed, so they're a lot more stable. They were just valued at $32 billion. Uh, so it's a pretty big, stable company, and they're moving into different categories. One of them that they're moving into right now, and this is currently in beta with thousands of testers, is their stock trading platform. This is what they wanted to sponsor me and get get more people aware of. They're moving into stocks and they're doing this aggressively. They have a lot of ambitious plans with it. For one, you can simply go in right now, do buys and sells of any company during market hours. You can do fractional shares or whole shares, and you can also trade without worry of them selling your information for payment for order flow. A lot of the other brokerages are doing that right now. FTX doesn't do that, and there's no fees with their trading. So go ahead and set up your account right now. It takes two minutes to do. It's completely free. There's no bait and swish. There's no upsells or anything like that. You simply open up an account. When you're opening up the account, use the refer code Carlson my last name, that lets them know that I sent you, it helps support the channel. And when you use that code Carlson, you will be automatically credited $10 when you do your first $100 trade. So your first $100 trade, you'll automatically get a 10% return. So there's a link in the pinned comment below if you wanna sign up now. All right, now let's go ahead and get back to this clip here. We have the Vici CEO, which is the CEO of one of my biggest holdings in my portfolio. I currently have a value of 37,900 in Vici, around 6,000 of that gains, and I plan to continue adding more to this company. I really like the leadership, I like the future of it, and I especially like the valuation and risk profile. I think the risk-adjusted returns of Vici, in my opinion, I think it will be pretty good over the next 10 years. But Vici has started off with the majority of its exposure in gaming real estate, which is, is basically gambling like Caesars Palace and MGM. And the Vici CEO here is explaining different experiential categories that they're going into. We're also very excited about growth in non-gaming, um, which was evident when we announced our very exciting transaction with Cabot. The first place outside of casinos that he mentions is Cabot, which I've known for a while that Vici's going into golfing, so this wasn't much of a surprise. One of the leading placemakers and operators in what we call pilgrimage golf globally. So we know that Vici's big into casinos, hotels, and golf. 
but what other categories might they be looking at? Now, Jim asks him if they plan on doing deals with the NFL, and Ed has a different category of sport in mind. We, we, no, we haven't cracked the NFL yet, but I will tell you that, um, that global soccer, global football is a category we're intrigued with, a category in which we are having some initial discussions. And global soccer, global football is a category that they're having initial discussions with. And he goes on to highlight that global soccer, they believe, will have more influx of cash and new capital into that sport category than the NFL. So we've seen Vici grow its business from gambling, hotels, golfing, and now they may be going into soccer. So I'll be along for the ride and I'll let you know if they announce any new deals. Now moving up to a different category of company, my biggest holding in total value is Apple. This company has been a great performer so far, even after the pullback, I'm still up $12,000. Now we know that Mark Zuckerberg is really excited about the metaverse. They bought Oculus. They've sold millions of these devices and they're spending around $10 billion per year on research and development just for the metaverse, just for AR. Mark Zuckerberg sees the metaverse and these headsets as the growth path for Facebook. It's why they changed the name of Facebook to Meta. And he recently just released a video of all the different headsets they're developing. Today, I wanna to show you four VR research prototypes that we're working on to invent displays that are as vivid and realistic as the physical world, and much more advanced than traditional computer screens we use today. First, we need retinal resolution, and that means getting up towards you know, about 60 pixels per degree. So we built Butterscotch. That's this prototype that lets you comfortably read the smallest letters on an eye chart. Second is focal depth. Normal monitors are a set distance away, so you just focus in one place. But in VR and AR, you need to be able to focus on things that are very close and very far from you. With Verifocal and eye tracking tech, our halftone prototypes let you focus on any object at any distance. We also need to fix optical distortions in software so quickly that it's imperceptible to the human eye. Next is high dynamic range. Nature is often 10 or 100 times brighter than modern HDTVs and the highest end monitors. And we need those colors to be just as vivid to feel realistic. So we built Starburst, the first HDR VR system that we know of. The goal is to fit all of these technologies into a device that is lighter and thinner than anything that currently exists. So we built Hollow Cake 2, a working experimental device using holographic displays that can already play PC VR experiences. Now there's still a long way to go, but I'm excited to bring all this tech to our products in the coming years. Now while Zuckerberg and Meta has been very open about their development and their goals and their process, even showing us their prototypes, there's other big competitors that have taken a different approach. Apple has been rumored to be working on the same project for some time, but all of this has really been rumors. We know that they've been working on this through deduction of employees and different people that have been hired at the company, different rumors and maybe a couple leaks, but so far this has been second and third party sources. Here's a clip right from the CEO of the company, the actual source, and he's asked specifically about AR and VR. Hi, Mr. Cook. Hi. Nice to meet you online. Chinese consumers are highly enthusiastic about VR and AR technologies, but some of them are not very satisfied with the products currently available on the market. So what do you think are the key factors for AR products such as AR headsets to succeeding in the mm. consumer market? He's asked specifically about AR and VR headset. Chinese consumers are excited about the prospects, but they don't like the devices that much. What does Apple have up its sleeve? That's a great question. Uh, I am incredibly excited about AR, as you might know. And the critical thing to, to any technology, including AR, is putting humanity at the center of it. And that is what we focus on every day. Uh, I couldn't be more excited about the opportunities we see in this space. This is where he gets to the important line of his little speech here. And sort of stay tuned and uh, you'll, you'll see what we have to offer. And sort of stay tuned and you'll see what we have to offer. I don't know if that could be more direct. Apple is going to release a virtual reality headset. Now there's still lots of questions surrounding this. When is it gonna be released? What is it gonna look like? What type of technology is it gonna use? A report by Mark Gurman on Bloomberg, which is one of the best leakers of Apple news, he's been pretty accurate. He says that Apple is going to flood the market with new products later this year. These new products should be somewhere between fall of 2022 and the first 
half of 2023. The new products will include four iPhone 14 models, three Apple Watch variations, several Macs with M2 and M3 chips, the company's first mixed reality headset, so they're calling it mixed reality, low-end and high-end iPads, updated AirPod Pro earbuds, a fresh HomePod, and an upgraded Apple TV. Sounds like they have a number of devices in store. Now Mark also goes into more detail on the mixed reality headset. He says that he's told the latest internal incarnations of the device run the base M2 chip along with 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's pretty powerful. That's like a lot of high-end laptops having the M2 chip and 16 gigs of RAM. They also say that they're already working on the release of the M3 chip, the successor to the M2. Again, technically these are rumors, these are reported from third parties, but when Tim Cook himself is saying, just wait and see, see what we have in store, I think he's giving some validation to the fact that they're going to be releasing an AR headset. And I've said this many times, and I know that it upsets people when I say it, because Facebook's an undervalued stock. Lots of value investors have piled into it. In many cases, it's their biggest holding. But again, if I have to choose between Facebook's AR VR headset and Apple's, which one I think will be the most successful, I'd much rather bet on Apple's hardware division and their developer base. I think in both cases, Apple's ecosystem, their developer base, and their hardware team is far superior to Facebook's. So when I look at the two options, I think that Apple is going to run away with this category. That's my prediction. I think they'll make Facebook become a small player if Apple does eventually introduce their own VR headset. Now that doesn't mean that Facebook's not a good buy, it can still be a good investment, but if I'm talking specifically about these two companies competing in AR and VR, I will bet on Apple every day of the week. Now that's all for now, I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll have more content out later this week. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and we'll have another update out this week.